back to World War Now, everybody. I am your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dimitri Kaligan here with another packed week of World War III analysis. That is right. This is our first episode in the midst of the beginning of the thousand-year Trump and Reich. That's right. Donald Trump was victorious in the 2024 presidential election on Tuesday, November 5th. I, of course, was watching. I stayed up, watched the speech, made sure I saw all of the history be made before I put my head to the pillow that night. So obviously, we're going to be discussing our reactions to that. I just want to say before I say anything else about, you know, teasing what we're going to talk about on the news in regards to the fronts around the world in World War III, because that is still very much happening and is escalating in the midst of the Trump victory. My election map that I predicted in the previous episode of World War Now, episode 93, you can go back and listen. It was exactly correct. I predicted Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, all of those states would go to Donald Trump, exactly 312 electoral votes, and that is exactly what happened. So total vindication for me on this prediction front, if I do say so myself, not to toot my own horn, but with all of that, I want to make sure everybody subscribes to the Substack worldwarnow.co. That is how you can get access to the show in your inbox every week when every episode and article gets released, and that is also how you can support the show behind the paywall and get access to every episode of Ether Hour. This week, we had our latest Q&A episode, so be sure to get behind the paywall to listen to that and ask a future question for another upcoming Q&A that we should do in the near future. So thank you so much to the supporters for that, but Diving right in on top of the Trump victory, we have to talk about the escalations in Israel. Yov Gallant was fired by Netanyahu, which was one of the main reasons that I knew Trump was going to win because Netanyahu did that mere hours before the election results came in. There's also big escalations, of course, in Russia, Ukraine, things going on there on the diplomatic front with Zelensky and Putin talking about the election. We have some escalations on the junta front with China supporting them. We have some escalations between Turkey and Syria and Russian-backed forces along the Turkish-Syrian border. We have news of the Iraqi strike, the Iranian strike, rather, from Iraq actually not happening and something different happening. So we're going to be getting into all of that, the Lebanon ground invasion, Hamas, all sorts of other issues, the supposed pogrom in Amsterdam, all of this stuff is on the menu. But with all of those things said, Dimitri, how are you? What is your reaction to the election? It's a pretty historic moment. I can't necessarily say I was surprised as my predictions came true, but it really is crazy, though, that we are living through this. No, certainly. And look, I wouldn't say this was the greatest or most important election of our lifetimes, but it certainly was an amazing one to witness in person. I think watching it more or less from beginning to end, following it that day and that night, I think it was just impressive just the way Trump managed to come back from the steal of 2020, from the entire COVID debacle and from all the media misinformation that was thrown at him and his party. And I would say all conservatives and Republicans. And I think the most impressive thing about the victory, not just Trump's energy and just his ability to come back from all the media storm that was thrown at him over the last you know, you can say basically decade. But just the fact that Kamala Harris and the Democrats, essentially all they ran on, and this was essentially evidenced by the reaction of the liberals and leftists, was essentially child killing and abortion. And this, I think, really paints that, paints a sort of picture that it really was a duty of Christians in this election. Now I understand that sort of after the fact, but in the US election, it really was a proper duty of Christians to vote specifically for the Republicans in this particular election, only because the left wing, Conrad, was so determined to make matters a lot worse. I think collectively on a moral scale, and I think geopolitically as well, it would have naturally very negative consequences. I mean, the entire Biden-Harris administration, we would just have to conclude that it allowed for various atrocities to take place in Ukraine, the situation in Ukraine became a lot worse. I mean, we saw all kinds of atrocities committed by the Ukrainian state. The Biden-Harris administration did not keep Zelensky and his administration accountable. And lest we not include, of course, the genocide of the Palestinians, which commenced in October and, of course, has continued on for more than a year now, and their failure to keep Netanyahu accountable and to sort of keep him restrained in any sort of capacity. We understand that perhaps Trump, you know, moving on to foreign policy, perhaps Trump will not provide any sort of alternative position on the Israel question, but at least in the Ukraine, I think given the recent reactions of especially Ukrainian spokespersons, Petro Poroshenko, for example, and other people in Eastern Europe, I think it's very clear that the Trump administration will have a very different effect on what's taking place in Eastern Europe. And I mean, domestically as well, like just for Americans voting for the best president that they can have out of the two candidates, I think it was very clear that Donald Trump would provide the more common sense and perhaps more right-leaning approach to to the immigration issue, to the issue of tariffs, improving the economy slightly, despite the fact that, yes, uh, we are, you know, I think the entire world, especially first world countries are headed towards a recession. The US debt situation is quite bad. But 
the only way to really improve it is to, I suppose, vote in people who actually have a common sense approach to capitalism, to tariffs, to trade, import and export, and to not become slaves of the Chinese, semi-communist, hyper-capitalist, essentially economic giant, which I think is what's happening. And we're not anti-Chinese by any stretch of the imagination, but we do need to keep in mind China is not essentially the good guy in this sort of historical layout. And I think generally speaking, Conrad, the <laughs> the election results, they were very impressive. I think given your predictions on the swing states, I didn't have such an optimistic view. In fact, I did not bet on the election at all because I was just worried that there was potentially going to be a stallion. Perhaps the votes were not going to be counted. It was tough to kind of have a certain outlook on the election outcome. But in the end, I think you were completely correct and your views were validated. So it's very impressive. Generally speaking, I'm incredibly happy about it. Now, what will the Trump administration do next? What kind of a team will Trump put together in January? I think this is what's on everybody's mind at the moment, because we do understand the 2016 Trump administration team was very much one which played up to the sort of Zog stereotype, right? We understand Jared Kushner was a member. We had Mike Pompeo, all these particular characters who made the situation in the Middle East and Eastern Europe a lot worse and sort of escalate towards you know, the future conflict, which we saw break out in 2022 and 2023. So essentially, you can almost say the bad side of Trump's administration in 2016 that he chose and that he had, the people he had around him, they caused what we now have as essentially the situation being on the brink of the Third World War. And, you know, maybe that's Trump's fault, perhaps it's his inexperience in Washington, D.C. politics, but this is essentially where we are at at the moment. And so, it's a huge responsibility on Trump, on perhaps people involved with the Project 2025 situation to essentially hire and employ very capable conservative Americans, Protestants, Catholics, maybe Orthodox Christians to be involved and to actually push the country in a positive direction because there really won't be a plan B, I feel. If this administration fails, some of its key goals, the next election will be extremely dire. And perhaps even in the next four years, we will see a proper breakout of the Third World War, which we have discussed here in its most hot and destructive form. And I don't think this is avoidable if this administration makes mistakes. So there's a lot of weight on Trump's shoulders at the moment. You mentioned some of those personnel people, and there's some good news and some bad news on those fronts. I'm going to break all of that down. But just before we move on too far deep into the weeds, I want to just break down some of the mechanics of the results in case anybody hasn't been paying as close attention as some people have. Of course, the Senate has shifted, of course, dramatically towards the Republicans. Now, I believe their majority is going to be 54 seats. They were able to flip Montana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. For a while, people really thought that the seats in Nevada and in Wisconsin were also going to flip, but it appears that some last-minute vote dumps got the Democrats ahead by 20K or so in each state, so perhaps the Republicans will be challenging those in court, but we shall see, regardless, very large Senate majority for the Republicans. They were able to maintain the House as well, which is frankly even a bigger surprise than the presidential or Senate victories, because the House is always biased towards the Democrats these days with the you know great replacement having occurred in the United States so thoroughly. But the real surprise, even beyond that, was Trump's victory in the popular vote. He is on track to, I believe, get 74, 75 million votes, maybe even a little bit more, I believe, when it's all said and done. And since we know that the Biden 81 million number is fake, this is like truly the highest number of votes a presidential election you know participant has ever received in history. And it was very impressive. His margin in California. He got over 40% of the vote in California. You know, he was outperforming himself in 2016 across almost every spectrum. And again, like he improved with many demographics, even though the election was very much a gender war, he still improved with young women. He obviously dramatically improved with young men, Latinos, you know, these other demographics. I know the demographics that went against him, the strongest black women, 91% against Trump, Jewish women, 88% against Trump. And I'm forgetting the third demographic, but, you know, kind of says it all right there. And the fact that Trump, you know, he carried many candidates to victory as well. Ted Cruz sailed to an easy victory here in Texas, despite, you know, not being the most popular senator. Many other Republicans were able to do the same. And in general, he has a mandate. It's not just that he won the election. He has a mandate. And because of his experience, like you said, Dimitri, in 2016, where many of these characters, you know, he got Rince Priebus and these other losers to help him staff you know, the first White House. And those people were all establishment Republicans and they betrayed the agenda. That's why we have no wall. Illegal immigration was terrible. And the trade revision that we did, you know, the, the trade improvements that we did with the 
replacements for NAFTA and these other things were not as extensive as they really needed to be with, you know, the industrial policy and the trade realignment that Trump had promised, you know, on the campaign trail. But this mandate does give Trump an opportunity to hire more people. The Senate majority gives him a chance to approve even more controversial people because Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, Mitt Romney, they're not going to be able to affect the majority because there are enough senators now that even if they decide to side with the Democrats, the Republicans can still nominate judges and cabinet members that might be more controversial to centrists and Democrats. But good news on the personnel front is that just today, as we're recording this on Saturday, November 9th, Trump announced that Mike Pompeo and Nikki Haley will not be involved in the cabinet or administration in any capacity. So that means no Mike Pompeo return as Secretary of Defense, no Nikki Haley return as UN ambassador or any other higher ranking role, which is wonderful, of course. We're hearing some other things. Unfortunately, Howard Lutnick, who we know is connected to Jared Kushner, and Jared Kushner is not involved in the campaign. He himself, or rather the administration, he himself has said that he will not be involved, but his ally and surrogate Howard Lutnick is and is in charge of the transition and may even be made head of personnel. And he has already confirmed apologies to all, you know, soul tards and health bros and these things, but he's basically already confirmed this Jewish guy that RFK Jr. will not be involved in HHS or any of these departments. You know, he might get shelved somewhere, but he's definitely not going to be a department head or cabinet member or anything like that, which, you know, a little disappointing. I obviously didn't have any illusions that that would happen, but I guess some people really did. And this is tearing them apart. But, you know, I hate seed oils and vaccines as the next guy, but Trump, you know, literally did Operation Warp Speed. So I didn't have any really illusions that that was going to be at the top of his agenda. There's a rumor that he's going to stick Thomas Massey as Secretary of Agriculture or something like that, which I think is a terrible idea. That's just a Jewish plan to get him out of Congress, you know, get the last anti-Israel Republican out of Congress, not criticizing APEC anymore, just focusing on fairly irrelevant farm legislation and execution of an agenda that is probably fairly standard zog tier Republican anyway. Maybe he would also be able to improve on some of the agricultural standards in the U.S., but frankly, I'd rather see RFK there, not Thomas Massey, leave him in Congress. I'd like to see him as the senator from Kentucky someday, but that's probably unlikely as well if these Jews have their way. But as far as any other you know, big news on the home front, Susie Wiles, Trump's main campaign advisor, has been made the chief of staff, already been announced, which, again, not ideal. She is not based in any capacity. She's just a lobbyist. She did help deliver Trump Florida in 2016 and has clearly not stupid when it comes to running campaigns. But some of the major things that were turning points on this campaign were actually Trump going against her and going with his instincts, like when it comes to a lot of the Haitian immigrant stuff and a few of these other stories. So not the best pick, but she is better than Brooke Rollins, who from America First Policy Institute, who is just a total Kushner surrogate. And you mentioned Heritage Foundation and the Project 2025, Dimitri. Mm. And there's rumors that Trump is talking to John McEntee, who is involved in Project 2025 and was back in 2020 during the actual best part of the Trump administration when we actually restricted illegal immigration and did a lot of really good things. He was in charge of personnel and actually was hiring good loyalists, you know, nationalists to execute things. And if he could actually get in and if all the Project 2025 hate was really just blustered for the campaign trail, that would be great. But unfortunately, the America First Policy Institute, you know, Howard Lutnick, these type of characters, they view the Heritage Foundation and Project 2025 as kind of their main ideological competition within Trump world to kind of eventually frame who will be the usurper, you know, rather who will be the heir apparent to Trump and what sort of the ideology of Trumpism will be when Trump himself is no longer in the picture, which if, you know, Kushner and these types have their, have their way, it'll be, you know, multiracial working class populism with a major love for Israel and, you know, letting in a bunch of legal immigrants while maybe restricting illegal immigration kind of or something like that. We just, we can't let that take root. So that's what's going on behind the scenes in Trump world. I'm encouraged by the no Pompeo, the no Nikki Haley. I'm under no illusions or rather delusions that, <laughs> you know, somebody like Colonel McGregor is going to be made the Secretary of Defense or that Thomas Massey, like I said, would be made something like Secretary of State even or something like that. But we can maybe hope for somebody better than, you know, a lot of the names being floated for these positions are people like Rick Grinnell. And we just don't need a homosexual neocon at the helm of these things. And I think if Trump is paying attention to the right people, he will make better decisions than worse. But I'm sure it'll be a mixed bag at best. And we will be keeping you posted on it, obviously, on all of the World War Now socials and covering it every week. But as far as the foreign policy stuff goes, yeah, I mean, I know Netanyahu was apparently the first foreign leader to talk to Trump, which is very blackpilling. I was always hoping that Trump would have secretly maintained his 
huge grudge against Netanyahu for siding with Biden, obviously, when the 2020 election was stolen. But there's even rumors that on the phone, Trump told Netanyahu that he can do whatever he wants. And obviously, Netanyahu was expecting to be given a much longer leash even before the inauguration. That's why he fired Yov Gallant. Gallant has been you know, talking to the media about the reason for his firing. We're, gonna get, we're going to get into the details of that a little bit in a second. But yeah, clearly the relationship with Israel will be increasing and Israel will, you know, it depends on how they want to go. It, it, they, the ball is somewhat in their court for escalation as much as it is in Iran's because the previous Israeli strike was very inconsequential. And we're also hearing fairly conflicting reports from different partisan outlets in Israel about the future of the war in Lebanon. So it's obvious that Israel is waiting, that all, all the factions involved have been kind of holding back for this election to go through. And I think in the next few days, we're going to see some pretty dramatic moves from Netanyahu and maybe from Hezbollah as well. They launched a massive strike on Tel Aviv in the past few days too. So it's not like things are cooling down on that front. But the other important leaders I know that congratulated Trump, Erdogan, very quick to congratulate Trump, no surprises there. And then we had Zelensky, who claims that Trump told him that he would support Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Putin, you know, the that's more of the question I want to ask you, Dimitri. What do you think is the behind-the-scenes communication between Trump's team and the Kremlin? And what did Putin say at his Valdai speech, at least, about Trump? And what were some of the recent comments that everybody has been making in the Russo sphere? You know, I think a lot of people are confused as to if Putin has personally spoken to Trump yet or not. Yeah, most interestingly, there's no confirmed telephone call that Vladimir Putin has had with Donald J. Trump yet. But he did personally congratulate him, at least in writing on the first occasion, and secondly at the Valdai speech, which was a four-hour presentation that Putin gave. He's very skilled now at giving these four-hour Q&As. Of course, all the questions are vetted ahead of time so that there won't be any surprises, even from international journalists. There won't be any trick questions that will bring around, possibly. I mean, the questions are a lot less censored than, say, some of the ones we receive on the Q&A at World War Now. So that's, of course, as per standard. But there was about a 20-minute segment Within those four hours of Putin's Valdai speech, where he actually mentioned certain new details, one of them was that he actually stated that Russia does not view the West as an enemy, which, I mean, goes completely against everything that he said since February 2022. The West has been painted as satanic. You've had certain members of the Russian Duma parliament openly calling for a desatinization of Ukraine, claiming that the West as a liberal democratic civilization is inherently anti-Russian. We've had all this crazy hawkish rhetoric from Russian politicians, including President Vladimir Putin for a little while now. I'm not saying it was unfounded, but simply that Trump's victory, and you mentioned some very interesting and I think pertinent details, Conrad, the fact that he has a mandate of the popular vote and, of course, the Senate, the House of Representatives, the Supreme Court, Trump has all the power now to make sort of unilateral executive decisions on foreign policy. Every nation understands this, and Vladimir Putin, I think, also does. And Russia is not. Russia hasn't really shown its strength in the Ukrainian conflict over the last, I would say, twelve months. Really, necessarily, progress hasn't been made. If anything, land has been lost. We've mentioned, of course, in the Donetsk People's Republic, yes, there's been quite positive expansion, but it can't be called dramatic by any stretch of the imagination. If you kind of divide it into twelve months, of course, Russian kind of pushing the Ukrainians westwards has been incredibly effective. But the losses in the Kursk region have, of course, painted a very different picture. And a lot of Russian citizens and people in the military are asking very interesting questions about what exactly are we doing in this SMO. But generally speaking, Putin's position on Trump seems to be very amicable and agreeable. In fact, it's almost as if the Western civilization has obtained a human face. And of course, that face being the face of Donald J. Trump. And suddenly, Russia can finally seek a friendly relations and cooperate with Donald J. Trump on like a personal basis. Wherein with Biden and Harris, it was very much these are only figureheads and personifications of the deep state of the military industrial complex and definitely the globalists, right? In their sort of personified form. Whereas Trump is kind of a personality. He is an individual, regardless of all these various interests which are standing behind him or perhaps trying to influence him from the outside, including his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, as we may understand. So that's, I think, one of the interesting things. And of course, Xi Jinping, for example, has also congratulated Trump very early on. And just on Friday, so less than 24 hours ago, Trump has had a very constructive discussion with Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president as well, which is very good. And in fact, he told Mahmoud Abbas that the conflict in in Palestine and Israel is going to be put to an end, which is very interesting. So he's given even a, essentially given a hand to even the Palestinian people, not in terms of you know, speaking friendly about Hezbollah, or Hamas, or at least the so-called elected Palestinian leaders are given this sort of 
an opportunity to perhaps seek a rapprochement with Israel and perhaps seek friendly relations. But we all understand that Trump's interests, of course, lie with the Zionists in the Middle East. So we should, as you said, we should not be under any illusions as to that. But it's definitely curious how both Zelensky, Putin, Xi Jinping, all these world leaders are all essentially bending the knee to Don, Donald J. Trump. And as we'll mention at the end of the lecture, even certain members of the Orthodox Christian clergy are doing the same. Donald Trump is very much, he has the American people united behind him. Yeah, sure. Maybe there's 30 to 40% of the population. I mean, the grown adult population who are such hyper liberals that they will not follow any of Trump's sort of mandates and they won't vote for any of his decisions or be pro-Trump in any particular capacity. But Trump does have 50 to 60% of the population who are very strongly for any decisions which he makes. And I think in the grander geopolitical and international relations scheme, Conrad, that's quite it's quite dangerous because we've moved away from this scenario, which we spoke about with Andrea Fonasiv. And I know you were very skeptical of it, and I think you were correct in the end. So your analysis was, of course, at the forefront, the most accurate one, which was that America, you know, just like after the 2016 elections, the 2020 elections, America would be destabilized from the inside. We do not see any of that destabilization here. We see essentially Americans coming together, united behind the Republican Party, united behind the figurehead of Donald J. Trump and most dangerously behind somebody like J.D. Vance as well, who is a very charismatic, very sort of mysterious type of figure. We know the people behind him are not very, not always aligned with the interests of the American people. He's very much a figure of the deep state as well, despite that certain positive traits which he does have. And he's a young man, so he can still probably learn and develop his approaches to politics. So I'm not exactly blackpilling and being uh, depressed over here. But optimistically speaking, I think America can make some very key choices for its representative Donald J. Trump and some of members of the party that in order to stop certain wars abroad, or perhaps on the more pessimistic angle, Conrad, we can see perhaps very, very negative developments. For example, a war with Iran, with this much support that Trump has behind him, it is actually for the first time a possibility which we can actually speak about in a very plausible manner for the first time in a while. Because you can't imagine the government of, say, Biden or Harris perhaps supporting a full-on Iranian invasion if Iran bombs Israel to such an extent that you know there are thousands of casualties and things of this nature. But a Donald J. Trump government with the people behind him, it's almost as if we're back in 2003, the early 2000s, where the entire American population after 9-11 has gathered together behind George W. Bush Jr. And it gives me that sort of feeling that perhaps this unity can be exploited for for negative purposes by the globalists. And I think this is the only fear really which I have regarding this very overwhelming Trump victory. Yeah, the overwhelming nature of the victory clearly provides a bit of a, it kind of makes the weird women crying TikToks and screaming, it makes them a bit hollow because at the end of the day, they know that Trump didn't have any kind of unreasonable opinions and that the vast majority of Americans that voted decided to cast their vote for him proves that this is obviously something that normal people can get behind. And these women are ultimately about to find themselves, you know, they're going to have to adjust their opinions or else they're going to be, they're going to find themselves outside the longhouse and female, you know, consensus seeking morality. That is, you do not want to be outside the longhouse. So they'll adjust accordingly. You know, what revolutions ultimately are not led by women. Women are the ones that reinforce the status quo the most strongly. So I'm not really worried about that as much as it is blackpilling to see young women, you know, literally seething and crying about a fantasy that doesn't exist about some handmaid's tale reality where they're going to get forced to give birth to some brood of children, which, you know, I think is somewhat of a repressed sexual fantasy that they're trying to, you know, project onto everybody else. But, you know, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> that's hard to be rambling. But yeah, as far as the election results, I was very pleased. I had a lot of people over, you know, everybody was excited, even though everybody, again, kind of understands the situation with Israel and Palestine and how, you know, Trump in many ways could escalate in certain regions. However, he did make some promises that he was against regime change in Iran a mere few days before the election. So that was promising. I don't feel guilty having ultimately cast my vote for him, even if, there, even if I had more hesitations than I definitely did in 2016 and 2020. But you look at the people that are supporting him, especially on the foreign policy front, even though the vast majority of Jewish Americans do not support Trump, Jewish elites, you know, Bill Ackman, David Sachs, these other characters are very much in the Trump camp right now because they recognize where the winds are blowing. Jeff Bezos is talking about hiring more conservative columnists at the Washington Post, all sorts of other people. Like I said, they even like LA Times, Washington Post, other newspapers refuse to even endorse Kamala Harris like they have in the past. So it proves that they're the winds of change are, in fact, you know, here. But I think the fact that the, for example, pro-monarchist Iranians, like the people that want to make Iran great again and restore the monarchy and, you know, abolish the 
revolutionary regime and take down the Ayatollah. Those people are some of the strongest supporters of Trump. So the fact that Trump is coming out against regime change, that must make them very unhappy. But I'm sure they're going to be in Trump's ear and whoever his Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense are very strongly as well. So we're going to keep you posted on the Trump war. But I think World War Now is going to be a lot more interesting with Trump in charge. And we're all excited for that as content creators at the very least. But we got to talk about the situation in Israel, specifically with the firing of Gallant. And this is from antiwar.com. Gallant has been making a lot of statements to Israeli media, and he's told even the Secretary of Defense of the U.S., you know, why, for example, he was fired. And we hear that Netanyahu had been purposefully boxing him out of meetings, trying to make him look bad. The media, all these other things. And Gallant recently said there's nothing left for Israeli troops to do in Gaza. The former defense minister told hostage families that Netanyahu was keeping troops in Gaza out of desire to stay there. Israeli media reported Thursday the former Israeli defense minister Yov Gallant told family members of Israeli hostages that there's nothing left for Israeli troops to do in Gaza, and the prime minister Netanyahu was only keeping them in the Strip out of a desire to stay there. Netanyahu fired Gallant on Tuesday, and according to the Times of Israel, Gallant's conversation with the hostage families came just hours before his firing went into effect and former foreign minister Israel Katz officially replaced him. According to Israel's Channel 12, Gallant told the families that conditions were ripe for a hostage deal with Hamas back in July and that he tried to convince Netanyahu to reach an agreement. The head of Shin Bet, the chief of staff, and I think the head of the Mossad also agreed with me, he said. During negotiations in the summer, Netanyahu began demanding that Israel maintain control of the Gaza-Egypt border, known as the Philadelphia Corridor. At the time, Israeli media reports and comments from his officials made it clear that Netanyahu inserted the demand as a way to sabotage the chances of a deal. I can tell you what there was not, security considerations. The IDF chief and I said there was no security reason for remaining in the Philadelphia Corridor, Gallant told the hostage families. Netanyahu said it was a diplomatic consideration. I'm telling you there was no diplomatic consideration. Gallant said Israel had no reason to keep soldiers in Gaza. Times of Israel said Gallant appeared to be referring to elements of the Israeli government that want to establish Jewish settlements in Gaza. Multiple Israeli ministers and members of the Knesset recently attended a Resettle Gaza conference and called for the expulsion of, Pal of Palestinians and the building of settlements. Israeli forces in northern Gaza are currently conducting an ethnic cleansing campaign known as the General's Plan. Haaretz reporters who were given access to Bayad Lachia, one of the areas where the plan is being carried out, said not a single home was left in the city as Israeli forces are demolishing buildings to forcibly replace Palestinians, and they have nowhere home to return now. So, obviously, Netanyahu knew Trump was going to win before the election took place, which obviously most people did at this point. By September, I think people realized that Kamala Harris was not going to be able to pull this off, but... He made the very bold move of firing Gallant, who is kind of the White House's guy in Israel at this point. He's the main contact between Lloyd Austin and the Israeli regime, between Biden and the Israeli regime. There have been We've reported on the show a dozen times that Gallant is the only one that people in the White House and the Pentagon even trust. So this is a dramatic escalation. Netanyahu knows that Trump won't have an issue with it and that he can say, screw you to Biden and all of his people now here in this lame duck session that Biden has until January when Trump is inaugurated. So I want to know your thoughts on Yov Gallant's firing, Dimitri, and your thoughts on the conflict in general. We got to talk about Lebanon, anything else going on in Gaza as well, because the Lebanon situation is just as interesting too. Yeah, absolutely. I think Yov Gallant's firing, as you've just said, is a clear indication that they're willing to take out the Democrats guy, like remove him now, whilst all the news is being focused on the Ameri on the Americas in order to probably see how the protests develop any further. We did see Yov Gallant supporters, so-called liberals, again, protesting on the streets. Again, these protests are being suppressed by Israeli police, Israeli Oman, essentially the Israeli version of the Spetsnaz. And the protests have been going on in Israel for more than a year now. Remember, they commenced in, in around the middle of 2023, and they've escalated ever since. And in fact, they really haven't died down, although most of the you know, Western media has not really focused on the anti-Benjamin Netanyahu and anti-Likud protests, which is very curious. Again, a very you know, pro Netanyahu position the mainstream media has taken. But Yov Gallant's firing, you know, we've seen changes in sort of military administrations for a little while now. It's not the first time a defense minister during an ongoing war has been fired or replaced. Like we did see the Ukrainian minister of defense, Alexei Reznikov of Ukraine replaced literally amidst the special military operation, Rustem Umerov, that mer happy merchant looking fellow with the big nose from Crimea, allegedly a Crimean Tatar, replaced him last year. So that was quite interesting. We did see Zaluzhny replaced, you know, the commander of the Ukrainian armed forces replaced for Sirsky, which was also, also a really big deal. And again, we probably the biggest change that we've seen was this year, actually, the exchange of Shoigu for Belarusov, which is, I think, enormous, given that Shoigu is the only person in the entire Russian Federation with a St. Andrew's X-Cross award, which he apparently received for the 2014 
Crimean referendum, Crimean annexation operation, which, um, again, there was some controversy as to what Shoigu actually had to do with that particular achievement, because it was primarily the work of the local Crimean forces, local Crimean, of course, politicians, and perhaps certain assistance from the FSB, which Shoigu has nothing to do with. But in any case, we have seen you know, changes of ministerial appointments regarding defense, regarding the military, and all these other countries were in, you know, which have been engaged in military action, Conrad. So this isn't the first time. It's not something that's groundbreaking, but it is very interesting because Israel at the moment stands essentially at the crux of a two-front war, and the war is escalating. But this week was no different. Naim Qasem's election as the leader of Hezbollah, you know, just a day ago, actually, he celebrated 40 days of Nasrallah's death, killing. Essentially, it was a big day of mourning for Hezbollah and for the Lebanese people who support Hezbollah. But we've seen Israel escalate its strikes against the Lebanese people. They've killed 40 on Wednesday, actually, the day after the U.S. elections in eastern Lebanon. This was the, probably the largest bombing campaign that Israel have conducted. The Lebanese Ministry of Health, so this is the official Lebanese government. It's not like some Hezbollah story. They've actually confirmed that 40 have been killed in one essentially in one day by Israel. And this is you know, huge losses. At the same time, in Gaza on the 7th of November, 50 people were killed with Israeli airstrikes. So Israel has continued these enormous, very effective airstrikes against civilian targets, which are intermingled allegedly with Hezbollah and Hamas militants, or as you know, the civilians are apparently mixed in with these arms depots and sort of military targets, which is why they're being hit. And again, this is the only news we're really receiving about this is from Israeli sources. You know, they're sort of claiming that they're not really aiming for civilians. But we've already heard this story for literally weeks on end. Again, we haven't seen Russia conduct similar strikes over Ukraine over the last two years. It's been incredibly humanitarian in its approach. So there, there are questions as to why Israel can't do the same in Lebanon or Gaza. And again, we, we've seen Hezbollah essentially respond in, in turn with its very long-range drone strikes on military bases around Tel Aviv. So this is beyond Haifa even. So essentially what Hezbollah has been doing is sending these very long-range drones of explosives that either, essentially these are suicide drones, which are smashing into key targets. They're not causing too much damage, but they are causing significant feelings of insecurity in Israel because never have have Hezbollah drones really flown that far south? And now they're flying south in quite large numbers. Again, nothing overwhelming, nothing equivalent to the Iranian drone attack or anything that we see with Ukraine flying these you know, crazy swarms of drones over Belgorod, Bryansk, and Kursk at the moment. But Hezbollah has been has been essentially escalating their actions. And also the death toll on the Israeli side, Conrad, has also gone up significantly. They've Hezbollah has been hitting kibbutzes all over northern Israel. Hundreds and thousands of Israelis are technically displaced. They're moving further south. The kibbutzes, as we understand, probably half of the kibbutzes residents are essentially, I mean, in northern Israel are essentially Israeli armed militants. So Hezbollah is seeing them as a target and it's freely firing these rockets over the border, which don't have to even fly that that far, just several kilometers. They're hitting these targets. And I think they've killed, over the last week, they've killed 20 plus Israeli civilians as well as members of the Israeli IDF, the military. So both sides have actually struck really hard over the last week, and this is regardless and despite the U.S. election, which is very interesting. So both sides understand that potentially Trump won't really change the status quo, and they really need to be firing and essentially fighting for their lives. I think Hezbollah, as we mentioned, they understand this very clearly, that Trump in no way is going to have any sort of peace talks with a representative of an allegedly terrorist organization like Hamas and Hezbollah. So they will be removed no matter what, as long as they have Iranian backing, then of course they're somewhat safe. But if Iran chooses the, if Iran through its government of Pezheshkin chooses the very, very peaceful liberal left-wing route and abandons Hezbollah, then Hezbollah is essentially done for, especially once the Lebanese government decides to side of the United States. I think the Hezbollah military wing understands this, and this is why they're firing and fighting essentially with all they have. And Israel, again, understands that it also has potentially a limited window of time, maybe until essentially January, in order to take as much land and essentially disarm and demilitarize as many so-called enemy objects related to Hamas and Gaza or perhaps Hezbollah in southern Lebanon before, of course, the enthronement of Donald J. Trump for the second time. So it's a very interesting situation we have here. And again, incredibly tragic because, as we mentioned, nothing really slows down. In fact, this has probably been one of the bloodiest weeks over the last year of the conflict in terms of just human losses and just how the war has been escalating. So, yeah, quite staggering, I'd say. Situation in Lebanon is actually getting pretty interesting. The head of the largest Christian party in Lebanon, Samir Gigea, he is coming out with a pretty bold anti-Hezbollah, not necessarily anti-Hezbollah, but 
very anti-militarized Hezbollah tone. He said that Hezbollah can only participate in the new Lebanese government if it becomes an exclusively political party. And his recent speeches all imply he's high on Israel's attacks on Hezbollah and the hope that by the end of the war, Hezbollah will crumble. So this guy is definitely hoping that, you know, in the midst of the Israeli attacks, whatever influence Hezbollah has in the official Lebanese government and on the rest of Lebanon will be greatly diminished. And this is proof as to the tough uphill battle that Hezbollah kind of has to face with, you know, its rear front not really protected at all. You have these people, these are, you know, mostly Maronites and some Orthodox people as well that are pretty much openly siding with Israel against Hezbollah because of inter-religious, you know, conflicts within Lebanon, which, again, I obviously am no fan of Muslims, but I think right now it's indisputable that having Israel turn your region to part of its, you know, greater Israel ethno-state project to bring back the Antichrist is not ideal on anybody's, you know, I don't think that's anybody's priority at all. It should be at the bottom of the list that everybody wants to, you know, kind of see happen. But in the midst of all of these, this war in Hezbollah, you know, Iran, who are obviously looking to reinforce their number one proxy, who are looking to make sure that Hezbollah doesn't fully collapse. I doubt they would want Hezbollah to demilitarize and become some kind of, I don't even know, some kind of just Shia party that is... I don't even know what they would be doing if they weren't protecting Lebanon's southern border and obviously standing in solidarity with Gaza. But there is a report, again, we saw that Iran had been moving missiles to Iraq supposedly to do this strike on Israel from Iraq that was supposedly even supposed to be bigger than the October 1st attacks. Those have yet to come, despite initial intelligence indicating they were actually going to come before the election. But despite the fact that, that hasn't happened yet, a report comes that Israel is considering attacking Iran new nuclear sites during the U.S. presidential transition. Uh, this is from antiwar.com. David DeCamp, he writes, Israel is considering hitting Iran's civilian nuclear facilities during the U.S. presidential tran transition period, Bloomberg reported on Wednesday. The report cited an Israeli official familiar with the thinking inside the Israeli security cabinet who said the handover period might provide Israel with a window to attack Iran's nuclear program. So this is something that you know, obviously, we know that the prophecies talk about how you'll be drinking your coffee and out of nowhere, the Jews will strike Iran's nuclear capabilities. And this time of presidential transition where everybody is still distracted with the Trump victory and all the things going on, it might kind of provide the necessary conditions for that to be fulfilled where people aren't expecting it. Because I think a few weeks ago, people might have been expecting it a bit more. But, you know, if they do it in this transitionary period, it will be like, who is, who do we look to to respond? Do we look to Biden and Harris? You know, Biden's senile and Harris lost the election. And Trump obviously just won, but he's not in office yet. You know, how do we respond to this imminent crisis? So that kind of hesitation could see Israel, you know, they want to take advantage of that confusion because as this article goes on, it says, realistically, Israel likely needs U.S. support if it wants to do significant dam damage to Iranian nuclear facilities that are buried deep underground. A U.S. official speaking to Bloomberg ruled out the idea of President Biden ordering an attack on Iranian nuclear sites in cooperation with Israel, but the U.S. is vowing to defend Israel if Iran responds to recent Israeli airstrikes that hit Iranian territory. And we know that even Biden was willing to give Netanyahu a green light if the Iranian strike, you know, surpassed October 1st. So, you know, even the people that don't want to see the nuclear facility struck kind of see that if Iran escalates, they'll just have to let Israel do whatever. So Israel is in, you know, a fair position on its own right to continue to escalate. And I think that, you know, they're comfortable where they're at right now with the state of escalation and they know that they can continue to take it further. So that is very interesting. And I think that, I don't necessarily think that is going to happen. I think that they want to see what goes on in Lebanon first. I think after Trump is in office, before they maybe do something that dramatic. But who knows? Again, like we said, it is going to catch people off guard. But unless you have anything to say about those strikes, we do need to talk about the fake news coming out of Qatar that, you know, Israeli sources, U.S. sources, apparently the U.S., you know, had leaned on Qatar after the Hamas-Israel ceasefire failed in Gaza and any of those discussions with the hostages that all fell through. So apparently the U.S. leaned on Qatar to expel Hamas. You know, Hamas's main political offices are in Qatar. That was where Ismail Haniya spent most of his time before he was, you know, killed in Iran. So Qatar is the place that provides sort of the safe haven for Hamas to operate and exist in the Islamic world as a political entity. And the U.S. was leaning on them to expel them, to ban them, to restrict them, you know, basically send them back to Gaza and the West Bank. I don't know where else they would go, Lebanon, I guess, Syria. But Qatar apparently said that that didn't happen, even though reports came out that it did, that Qatar had closed the Hamas office, that they had been expelled. Qatar is disputing this, claiming that that is not true. So very high level pressure going on. I know a lot of people in the US that are anti-Israel often get accused of being Qatari agents, but the red pill on that is that accusation is actually something that is made by Emirati agents, specifically Saudi agents, people that are 
kind of engaging in this behind the scenes influence war in the Islamic world and the Gulf states and these oil producing, you know, Saudi, Iranian, the, the states that exist between these two Shia and Sunni superpowers. You know, that's the accusation because Qatar is a key linchpin that connects the axis of resistance in Iran with other, you know, Sunni powers and, you know, Sunni money and these sorts of things. So it's a very important node. But what are your thoughts on the potential strikes on Iran? And more importantly, what are your thoughts on the future of Hamas, Qatar? And then we can perhaps move to discussing the supposed pogrom that went on in Amsterdam. Yeah, you know, we are still waiting in anticipation for Iran to make a return strike. And I think all the news coming out of Iran, their posturing, the rhetoric, their sort of hawkish position, and the fact that Pajeshkin, you know, has just visited Kazan and there will be a visit in the future to Moscow again, uh, really shows us that Iran really is making, is going to make its move like in the next few weeks. When exactly, we're not too sure. Although I think given that Trump's, you know, decisive victory, I think that's the only thing that may sort of hold them back and maybe give them second or third thoughts in order to reconsider whether they want to re-engage with Israel at the moment. But you have to consider, again, Hezbollah, which is now being st struck very heavily, is, again, very dependent on Iranian aid. And Iran, again, as a country who which has pride and sort of personal interests, Iran Iranian sovereignty has been breached several times now with Mossad spies, Mossad terrorists, etc. Iran has been attacked from essentially two angles, from ISIS-K from the east and again by Israel from the West, it's very much feeling like that it needs to prove itself. So I think the strikes will take place, probably not this week, but definitely in the near future. But whether or not those strikes will be simply symbolic, like the previous strikes with very minimal casualties and simply striking certain secret Israeli bases, which of which the footage will never receive, right? Or you know, will never receive proper information as to what the damage really was, or if these strikes will actually target specific decision-making centers, right? Which for example, Russia has not struck in Ukraine yet, but perhaps Iran will target some of those really key areas of the Israeli bureaucracy and in order to put that particular country on its toes and actually threaten it for real. Again, this is probably the most pro-Iranian position that one can take in terms of predictions for the future. But regarding Qatar, one of the more mysterious countries, right? Exactly. The recent news about Qatar kicking out Hamas has been already debunked. So the senior Hamas officials have stated that, yes, there will be a suspension of mediation, and Do but Doha will not be kicking out the Hamas lobby, the Hamas center in Doha of Qatar will not be getting shut down. Qatar is a very interesting position. I've heard very bizarre conspiracies that perhaps given the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim Al Thani. He has very close relationships to the King of England. Perhaps there is a sort of this Arabic British monarchical conspiracy going on. We do know the British Empire was behind a lot of the Middle Eastern monarchies at the you know, beginning of the 20th century after the Russian Revolution and before the establishment of Israel. There were very close connections between the city of London and some of these new monarchies that arose and these emirates which arose in the, in the Middle East. So it's a very interesting connection there. And also the fact that Sheikh Tamim Al Thani, right, the emir of Qatar, was the first person to congratulate Vladimir Putin during his victory in 2024 was the first one to make the phone call. Another very interesting connection, almost symbolic in that capacity. But Qatar, yes, a uh, very unique country. But yes, I think the news about Hamas being kicked out of there is completely fake. It's just the news regarding Doha, I think, has just proven that any mediation talks, Conrad, unfortunately, have fallen through. There's been too much blood spilled. And this is one of the negative sides of escalating a conflict to this point, wherein it doesn't even seem possible to um, sit down at the same table to discuss a peace treaty of any sort between Hamas, the Palestinian people, and Israel. It's simply not possible, especially after the loss of so many lives, and especially the lives of innocent people, not just militants and people involved in military combat. So that's the really sad side of this. But regarding, of course, the further fake news from Amsterdam, right? The Netherlands, the Maccabees, Tel Aviv Maccabi Football Club, some of the anti-Palestinian shenanigans going on over there on the eve of Kristallnacht as well, right? The Kristallnacht, that sort of anti-Semitic event that took place in Nazi Germany. <laughs> Again, it's almost coincidental. And the OIV cries, the, the cries for help have arisen all, all around the world. The Netanyahu's cabinet sent over two planes in order to rescue the poor Jews who are you know, subject to alleged pogroms by football fan clubs. And you know there was a clash, right? There was a clash in, Neverland, in Amsterdam, Netherlands. And I think most of us who are very interested in sort of a renaissance or early enlightenment history have found it very curious because the Amsterdam and the Netherlands was one of the linchpin bases of, shall we say, mercantile Jewry, right? This is one of the places after Genoa and Venice where a lot of Jewish merchants actually traveled to, and they used Amsterdam as a base. Um, if, as you can imagine, a lot of the slave trading Jewish privateers 
the ones who actually owned the slave ships were very closely involved with Amsterdam. There was also a huge presence of Jewish capital in Amsterdam. You know, London was one base, Amsterdam was another. And in fact, it was one of the princes of Amsterdam who actually asked Peter the Great to invite the Jews from Poland to travel to Russia and to live in Novorossiya, as well as places of Great Russia, you know, places like Moscow. And Peter the Great, well, well, during his visit to Amsterdam, actually o- openly refused. He said, look, we're not going to be allowing any Talmudic Jews to travel to the Russian Empire and to live here. I'm sorry, we're not anti-Semitic or anything, but we just can't do it. It's not part of our religion to allow these people to live alongside us and in our country. So Amsterdam was always sort of a base. And it's not surprising then that the constitutional king, the monarch of Netherlands, actually spoke out openly, has called this essentially a football club riot, which we know takes place all over Europe. You know, football fans, they fight all the time, Conrad. And I'm not personally a fan of football or soccer, but I know Europeans feel about this sport very passionately. And so this really shouldn't be surprising. But because some of the victims of these riots and pogroms, well, alleged alleged pogroms were members of, you know, were Israelis, were members of the Jewish community of the Netherlands. The framing of this particular event was very, very, again, philo-Semitic, very much in the sort of scope of the October 7th, essentially a third Holocaust, and very eye-opening, I think, to the fact that these are the most privileged people of Europe, these are the most privileged people in the entire world, and God forbid anything ever happens to them where even in this particular case where it wasn't entirely provoked, their anti-Palestinian uh, slogans are tearing down of Palestinian flags. Nobody really asked that to take place, but nevertheless, they went ahead with it. And as we know, Europe in and of itself, and most likely because of the influence of these particular people, has invited a lot of Middle Easterners into Europe, into Netherlands, right? There's the very reason why there are Moroccans, North Africans, and members of the Islamic community living in Europe is because Europe itself has chosen the melting pot theory, which, you know, you just have to have a look at who coined the term melting pot just to kind of see exactly how this connection is made. But it's almost like a self-created issue for the local Jewish communities of the Netherlands, which now the fruits of which they are consuming. But as we know, the regular people of the Netherlands, again, are suffering because of this and they're being psyoped entirely by the mainstream media, which is now painted essentially this is the third Holocaust after October the 7th and after the events of the Second World War. So again, something to distract us after the election of Donald J. Trump and something to sort of bring about the idea that, well, it's Israelis and Talmudic Jews who are the primary victims, not the thousands of Palestinian children being killed or the tens of Lebanese innocents who have been bombed this week and killed in Lebanon in a completely unprovoked airstrike. So again, a massive media distraction. Yeah, the Israelis dispatched cargo planes. They wanted to evacuate Jews from the city. They the Israeli, all these people were issuing, you know, no travel orders for Jews to Amsterdam. They were trying to turn this, just like they're trying to turn October 7th into, you know, this crazy new Holocaust 9-11 thing. They're trying to turn this into a literal, a new Christian knocked on the anniversary. And it doesn't make any sense. It was football hooliganism. It was provoked by the Israelis. They were doing anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian chants during moments of silence for Gaza. They were just as provocative as the Moroccan fans on the street. And the Moroccan fans, there was just more of them. And they one and they were the ones being more intimidating and that's how it went and the Israelis, you know, they they control the media and their ethno nationalist identity if with their, you know, ethno state over there allows them to operate. You know, whenever Jews are threatened, Israel gets to get involved and they their intelligence agencies get to get involved. It's extremely unfair and should not be accepted. And if that's going to be how it goes, then obviously Jews need to be expect to be under scrutiny in any country that they are, if they are de facto agents and citizens of this nation. But I think the fact that this has been made into such a big deal shows that Israel is trying to gin up, you know, this. they want Trump to think of this like, oh, right on my victory, you know, the Jews got attacked. This is definitely aimed at Americans as well and Europeans, people that might be thinking of toning down their support for Israel and really, you know, accepting Mm -hmm. a a ceasefire that Netanyahu doesn't find, you know, 100%, you know, to his liking. And of course, we know that the moment things, you know, toned down, he has to face the music on all of the domestic accusations against him. So he has to extend this as as long as he wants. But moving to the other issues in the Middle East, before we talk about Russia, Ukraine, one of the biggest news that we really focus on and cover are the situations between the Turkish proxies and the Russian proxies in Syria. And one of the big issues right now is that Turkish border forces are just directly firing on Syrian Arab army Assad-backed forces within Syria. This is from SyriaHR.com. Amid displacement of civilians, Turkish forces fire artillery shells on village and military checkpoint of the regime in Aleppo. Aleppo province, Turkish forces and their proxies fired heavily artillery shells on Al-Safi village and areas of the Manbij military council in eastern Aleppo, 
where dozens of shells randomly landed in the center of the village and civilians, you know, displaced and displaced civilians towards neighboring villages. However, no casualties were reported. Moreover, a military checkpoint holding regime soldiers in the same village was shelled. On November 7th, two regime soldiers were killed under artillery shelling by Turkish forces stationed on bases in the Euphrates Shield area, targeting Jat, Tukar, and Alwat villages in the Manbij countryside, east of Aleppo in areas occupied by the Manbij military council. So direct assaults on, again, these could be Russian forces for all we know. Russian forces are deployed as intimately with Syrian Arab army forces. So I don't think that's what happened, but these are forces that are direct allies of Russia. When Russia does airstrikes, these are the forces on the ground that are often doing the work. And Russia, we know, reinforced one of its big bases on the border with Israel and the Golan Heights in Kunetra in Syria. And Russian military police is actually deployed there. So Russia and Syria are very close allies. So Turkey, we know that we're going to talk about Turkey and Israel and Ukraine and Russia when we talk about Russia, Ukraine. But You know, Turkey, obviously very against Israel, very pro-Hamas, pro-Palestine, and ostensibly neutral on the Russia-Ukraine issue. But they are, you know, despite Erdogan wanting to meet with Assad, he has clearly reneged on that and is striking him and is trying to exert a large amount of Turkish influence in this bigger and bigger buffer zone in the Syrian-Turkish border regions. So that is very interesting and ongoing. We also hear reports that there are going to be joint Iranian Azeri drills in the Caspian Sea, which I don't know too much about. I'm wondering how that is even going to happen. But I want to hear your thoughts on that, as well as, you know, the Turkish situation. We know that Erdogan is actually about to meet with MBS as well. So big developments between the countries around the Levant that exert their influence on the Islamic world, for sure. Yeah, these are giant news for the Middle East. I think, first and foremost, the visit of Erdogan to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and to actually meet MBS in person. But this is as part of the greater organization of Islamic countries. There's a forum that's going to take place in Saudi Arabia. But generally speaking, when a nation's leader needs to actually travel and meet in person, there are actually two considerations. The first one is for PR reasons, right? It's a huge diplomatic move. It shows respect, shows sort of mutual cooperation between two nations because the personified leader of the country is actually going out, out, out of his way going sort of on an uncomfortable journey to a foreign place in order to represent his nation, shows a sort of friendliness between the Turkish and the Arabic peoples, because as we understand, the three main nations of the Middle East, of the Islamic Middle East, is against, again, the Turks, the Persians, and, and the Arabs. And so you have the leader of the Turks meeting with the leader of the Arabs. It really makes sense here. Although the second consideration beyond PR and diplomacy is the fact that you can actually when two leaders meet in person, all the cameras are off, all the microphones are off, and they can actually speak very frankly with just their interpreters present perhaps or maybe in a common tongue, and they can actually discuss things which will never be sort of spied on and which will never be allowed to happen. I think the best example of that was during World War One in June of 1916, the actual Minister of Defense of the British Empire, Lord Kitchener, traveled or was planning to travel to St. Petersburg to meet with Nicholas II. This is right before the revolution, less than eight months before the revolution, in order to discuss how the Middle East and how Europe was going to be divided after Russia, the UK and France defeat Germany, Austria and Turkey in World War I. So essentially to discuss the taking of Constantinople. And Lord Kitchener, the defense minister of the UK, was killed because his ship sunk on a German mine off the coast of Scotland. And so it was a massive event eventually led to, of course, the revolution in Russia, the UK, Russian relations broke down. This was the largest loss of the UK of any senior member of their government during the First World War. But notice how he was on a secret mission in order to discuss, in order to discuss sort of relations between the Russian Empire and the British Empire at the time. Here we have Erdogan very openly traveling to meet with MBS. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. There's the war between Iran and Israel, which is taking place. There's Israel's position in the Middle East. What will be the position of the somewhat philo-Semitic Arabs and the position of Turkey? Perhaps they'll be discussing the role of Assad in the future. Who knows? But it's very a very symbolically powerful visit that Erdogan will be conducting next week. And most likely, if it does take place before our next recording, we'll kind of discuss any outcomes of that particular visit over there. And of course, the other curious thing, Conrad, I think, given the fact that these joint Saudi-Iranian naval drill, drills have been cancelled and called off, right, essentially proclaimed non-existent by the foreign minister of the of Saudi Arabia, I think the most curious thing is that Iran is very eager to conduct any sort of naval drills, even with a smaller country like Azerbaijan, which barely has a navy. I mean, these naval drills will essentially only take place in the Caspian Sea, which is essentially like a large lake by sort of world standards and 
The, it will only involve a few ships of Azerbaijan, but generally it will be giving Iranian and the, the Persian Navy a certain, certain warm-up. Exactly what the Iranians are preparing for, it's very curious, but as we see the situation in the Persian Gulf and essentially the American Navy looming large, essentially patrolling what can be only referred to as Iranian waters at this point, very dominantly there, it does seem like Iran is very interested in providing some of that key drill and key strategic tactical experience to some of its naval officers because they do see what's looming over the horizon. So this is why it's so eager to sort of conduct any joint drills of some of the neighboring uh, Muslim countries in the region. I think this is why this particular story is of such interest in, in the Middle Eastern context. Now, the region is really firing on all cylinders. There's, as we're recording this, U.S.-U.K. strikes are ongoing on Sana'a and other regions of, that the Houthis have control over in Yemen, which, again, the Houthis are still being very, very effective in the Red Sea. They have apparently two billion plus in revenue from their extortions on the ships and the hostages and the ships that they have, you know, captured and whatnot. So they're doing just fine. And we talked about the past about Russia, Russia opening their embassy at the Southern Transition Council. Maybe we'll do a deeper discussion on the whole Yemen situation in the future. But yeah, the whole situation in the region is developing rapidly towards, again, we've spoken about the prophecies of the Russia versus Turkey clash in the region, how that will unfold after Erdogan's death, and of course the Israeli strikes on Iran's nuclear capabilities. But uh, before we talk about you know the situation in Russia and Ukraine, obviously the prospect of Iranian-Azerbaijani joint drills is very interesting. I'm wondering how that will affect the situation between Israel in that region. But just to give a brief breakdown of the kind of U.S. deployment right now, the U.S. military said Thursday that additional F-15 fighter jets arrived in the Middle East as part of a buildup meant as a threat to Iran, as Tehran is vowing it will respond to Israel's October 26 airstrikes on Iranian territory. Uh, today, U.S. Air Force F-15E strike eagles from the 492nd Fighter Squadron, RAF Lake and Heath, Ethan, Lake and Heath, England, arrived in the U.S. Central Command Area of Responsibility, U.S. CENTCOM wrote on X. The Pentagon announced last week that it was sending additional military assets to the region for the defense of Israel. CENTCOM said that B-52 bombers arrived in the region on November 2nd. According to flight and satellite data, six U.S. B-52 bombers are at the al Udaid Air Base in Qatar. Haaretz reported that the U.S. F-15 fighter jets were being sent to Jordan. The Pentagon said that it would also be deploying additional U.S. Navy destroyers and tanker aircraft to the region. Before the latest deployments, the Pentagon sent a THAAD missile defense system and about 100 troops to Israel. The U.S. assets in Israel and elsewhere in the region could become more potential targets of Iranian missiles since the U.S. is vowing to defend Israel. Recent media reports have said Iran is planning to launch a major attack on Israel from Iraqi territory. Baghdad has denied the rumors, saying they're false pretexts to justify aggression against Iraq. So, the situation is very high. Any amount of U.S. troops and majorly expensive hardware could come under Iranian fire and create a pretext for an escalation of war, which, again, in this transitionary period, who knows who would be able to get that under control. The Pentagon might be able to operate, and bad actors in the State Department might be able to ap operate very freely. But the situation, obviously, between Russia and Ukraine is probably the most dramatic you know, change that we're going to see as Trump gets inaugurated as far as the foreign policy outlook of the United States is concerned. And we're hearing Zelensky desperately trying to get ahead of the news cycle. Or Trump is going to support us, you know, we promise. And we're hearing about this demilitarized zone and the potential for U.S. and EU troops to be on the current line of contact and cede all of the current territory to Russia, which again, I think if Russia accepted that, that would be treasonous on the part of Putin. But Dimitri, I want to know your thoughts. We're hearing that the Ukrainians have apparently confirmed and come in direct conflict and fought against North Korean troops in Kursk. That's apparently being confirmed by Ukrainian intelligence. So I want to know your thoughts. What is actually happening? Has What do you think Zelensky and Trump talked about? What do you think Putin is thinking about in regards to the map when it comes to Trump? And you know what exactly is going on in Kursk with these North Korean troops? Yeah, so essentially they've stated that there was a very small engagement in the, and this was confirmed by the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, Rustem Umerov, the happy merchant, as we like to say. If you have a look at this photograph, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. But a very small engagement, so small firearms, sort of battle in the trenches and the tree lines. So you have to understand the Kursk Oblast is essentially littered with trenches at the moment, littered with, it's, it's very muddy, very uncomfortable sort of travel in. And allegedly the Ukrainians in all this, uh, forestry and, and the tree line have noticed some some North Koreans, again, dressed as Russians. Mind you, firefights on the front lines are quite rare. And the fact that Russia would send in North Koreans into the front lines of combat with only a few months of training is, again, highly unlikely. And mind you, these North Koreans will be dressed essentially as Russians. So who exactly the, the Ukrainian troops saw in those tree lines, in those sort of tr trench battles, again, unconfirmed. There were a lot of fake photos, Conrad, of essentially like what looked like a 
dead, uh, essentially person of Asian descent, Asian heritage, lying there. And of course, someone holding up a North Korean passport over his body and essentially confirming the first kill of a North Korean soldier. But nevertheless, there was another confirmed engagement between Ukraine and North Korean troops, which was uh, essentially a HIMARS uh, long-range artillery strike against the Russian base in Kursk, which apparently yielded some North Korean casualties who were stationed nearby, near the front line, but kind of like not exactly directly engaged with Ukraine there. So that's, I think, the more likely possibility that if there were North Korean stations somewhere in Kursk, that potentially they could have been bombed by Ukrainian artillery. But until we receive a Russian confirmation, I'm kind of not really believing that the Ukrainians would, of course, take first blood in this particular situation, given the fact that they have been losing essentially one to three villages every single day in the Kursk Oblast over the last uh, two months, as we can say. Consistently, Russia has been pushing Ukrainians back. This was confirmed by Putin's Valdai speech, where he mentioned, he actually gave us some numbers. He stated that over 300 tanks and armored armored vehicles have been destroyed by the Russian forces in the Kursk Oblast. He said that the numbers are almost more than have been, the numbers of losses that Ukraine has suffered in Kursk have almost amounted to the losses over the entire 2023 year, which is quite, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration because we do know what happened in the Bakhmut meat grinder where Prigozhin claimed that the Ukrainians lost 70,000 troops if you recall, when that particular siege ended. So I think Vladimir Putin was a bit overestimating the losses of Ukraine, but nevertheless, he was very optimistic during his Valdai four-hour speech about what was taking place in Kursko Oblast. At the same time, we did see a member of the Ukrainian military, Conrad, actually very openly mention that Ukraine was planning to hold on to any land that could in Kursk, including, of course, the, the town of Suja, the largest sort of town that Ukrainians have captured, because Suja, again, is... Um, the gas metering station, which travels through Ukraine to Austria, Hungary, and the eastern as well as central European states, very key gas metering station. Actually, the pipeline runs through Suja, which Ukraine control at the moment. We've been mentioning how this could potentially be like a an unit of blackmail against Russia, where Ukrainians could say, "Look, if you siege Suja like you did in Bakhmut of Divka, we'll simply blow the gas metering station up, and it'll take you a few years." Well, you know, throughout us sort of harassing you with drones or long-range artillery strikes for you to rebuild this gas metering station, your relationship with Eastern and Central European countries, which rely on Russian gas, will, of course, suffer. And so they can essentially blackmail Russia in this capacity. But we haven't seen any confirmations of that theory. A Ukrainian officer named Dmitry Korshinsky, in an interview, actually, a few days ago, just after the Trump's re-election, he actually openly stated that if Ukraine was to hold on to all this Suja land and land around Kursk that it has captured, once negotiations do take place between Russia and Ukraine, once the demilitarized buffer zone is established between the two countries, Ukraine can exchange all the land which it took from Kursk and exchange it for the right side of the Dnieper, essentially the eastern side of the Dnieper around Energodar. Now, what's interesting about Energodar, why would Ukraine want this land back? It's because there is a Zaporozhye therm thermal power plant located there. And there is, of course, the famous Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, which is located, again, on Russian, essentially Russian-occupied Zaporozhye territory. And so it almost seems like a fair trade, if you think about it. Kursk is such a key region to Russia at the moment. It's heavily populated, one of the most orthodox Christian regions per capita. It's a strong, it's a strong likelihood that the Ukrainians have stubbornly cemented themselves there, and they're not going to leave without essentially a last stand type situation. The cauldrons have taken place. There are allegedly thousands of Ukrainians still being surrounded in some of the villages and locations. But Ukraine really does want this uh, nuclear Zaporozhye power plant station if a peace line was to be drawn by Donald Trump, you know, by Zelensky and Putin. Because again, yeah, not only does the thermal power plant and the nuclear power plant provide a lot of jobs, it also guarantees energy to some of the key Ukrainian cities. For example, Zaporozhye, Dnipro, which has one of the largest Jewish communities, and it provides energy to almost all of central Ukraine. It's one of the only real sort of capable and up-to-date nuclear power plants in all of Eastern Europe at this point. So it's a very key location. So I'll definitely see this potential trade being spoken about in the future. Regarding diplomacy, we did see Donald J. Trump speak with Zelensky over the phone. We were not privy, of course, to the conversation, but in a very interesting turn of events, allegedly the video... The phone call between you know Donald Trump and President Zelensky was there was an intercession by a certain third party, and guess who? It was Elon Musk. He actually joined the telephone call, and it turned it into a teleconference of sorts. And what would Elon Musk say to Zelensky? Could he promise more Starlink satellites if Zelensky was to go for a peace call? Would he promise to build potential industry in Ukraine, perhaps uh, bolster up Ukrainian infrastructure if Zelensky was to take these sort of 
because Elon Musk, he's known for making these very strong, bold statements, but why would he join into a call between two presidents? Of, I mean, Elon Musk is turning himself into a real sort of subject of world politics at this point. We can say that his support through X, through essentially news media, or through the Joe Rogan interview, support for Donald Trump, you can almost say that that partially won Trump the election. And now he's directly involving himself in some of the key war zones around the world. It's very curious, definitely an interesting character. But that particular conversation took place before any sort of official phone call between Trump and Putin, which I think will most likely happen in the future. And again, everyone's talking about which country will Trump visit first, you know, as president-elect potentially, or even in January of next year. But my guess is most likely it'll be either the European Union or it'll most likely be Israel in order to show support. As, you know, as, as negatively as I view these particular countries, it won't be Beijing, it won't be Moscow, it won't be it won't even be Kiev, I think. I think Donald J. Trump will travel to some of these safer areas in order to sort of guarantee his support for, one, for a sort of European integration and alliance with the United States, and two, for, of course, the United States standing behind Israel, which we know Donald Trump feels very strongly about. But in Ukraine at the moment, Conrad, generally speaking, Russia is doing very, very well. Around the Kupyansk region in the north western side of Donetsk, it's pushing very far. Ukrainians have now really cemented themselves and have not left the city of Taryetsk as of yet. In fact, what's happening is as Russians are taking these apartment buildings in Taryetsk, Ukrainians are planting bombs and uh, essentially demolition styles. Ukrainian military engineers are planting essentially demolition bombs in the basements of some of the apartment buildings. So as the Russians go into these buildings with squads of four to eight soldiers at a time, there's always a risk that Ukrainians will remotely detonate the entire apartment building and it will fall atop of the Russians. We've actually seen this happen there's been reports from Volchansk, which is in the Kharkovsk Oblast, which is all, all the way up north, that Ukrainians have been blowing up entire apartment complexes on top of the Russians as they were climbing up the stairwells and as they were sort of clearing out the basements in some of these areas. So incredibly dangerous style of warfare. This is not exactly trench warfare. It's more like some sort of World War Z, futuristic, very apocalyptic style of siegecraft, which we're seeing here. So Ukrainians and Russians are still fighting very heavily in Taryetsk. It hasn't been lost yet. There's still talks about Russians sieging Pokrovsk, but at the moment, there's been no official reports that Russia has advanced anywhere near Pokrovsk. They are close, but they're not exactly sieging or bombing Pokrovsk. And that would be, I think, the biggest turn of the war if that actually happens before the Trump presidency, because Pokrovsk is such a giant city, you know, more than 10 churches, several monasteries. It's very populated. It hasn't been evacuated at all. And so it's It'll be quite scary, I think, if Russians begin sieging it in the same fashion as they've been sieging Mariupol, Bakhmut, Avdiivka, I think, because we know how the Ukrainians react, and they react by essentially seizing local citizens, using them as meat shields, etc. So it won't be exactly a humanitarian war if that takes place. Now, we're hoping that with Trump's accession to power, that a favorable peace to Russia will be able to be received. I don't think Trump has some bizarre fixation that at the very least, the four oblasts plus, plus Crimea can't be fully Russian and then a DMZ on top of that. But again, I think the Russians would be remiss not to push for more territory than that before even getting to the negotiating table. Trump, of course, claimed that he was going to end the war before he even got inaugurated. So mm-hmm. we're definitely going to be keeping a close eye on that because that was one of his stated goals. But other things going on in the region, of course, Poland is fortifying its border with Kaliningrad and Belarus. They're adding a bunch of these concrete hedgehogs, you know, the spiky roadblocks that you can see on, you know, when people try to invade some of these metropolitan areas. You see them a lot in Russia and Ukraine right now in the midst of the war there. But, you know, Belarus and Lukashenko have accused the Poles of being aggressive on their border, trying to aggravate war with them, despite Belarus also claiming that there's no risk of some kind of invasion of NATO or Eastern Europe from Kaliningrad or from Belarus by Russian forces, which, again, we've known that this entire time. But at the same time, we see Mark Rutte, NATO chief, visiting Hungary, you know, one of the number one allies of Russia within NATO. And he recently stated, Hungary makes an important contribution to our difference, to our deterrence and defense capabilities, including through its growing defense industry. We know that Hungary does produce a fair amount of its own weapons. So obviously they are trying to, you know, keep Hungary in its sphere of influence, despite the fact that, you know, now with Trump's victory as well, Orban will be even freer to kind of act how he wishes. And we see Trump already going to start putting the pressure on NATO to meet the spending goals themselves and not just rely on the United States with its blank check to come and, you know, do all of its dirty work for it. Of course, we see Moldova as well, unfortunately, has, we know they elected Maya Sandu and they have shifted more and more towards, you know, the globalist, you know, state of things. And we will see if there's a new 
kind of attitude towards resolving the Transnistria Prednistrovia issue. We're going to be keeping a close eye on that. I'm wondering if Trump will somehow weigh in on that as well. But unless you have anything else to say about the EU situation, about anything with their support for Ukraine, any developments there, we probably need to talk about the church persecution situation and Metropolitan Aga Fongal's letter, which I think a lot of people were talking about this week. Yeah, of course. Before we move on to church persecutions, the last point I'd like to make is that at the Valdai speech, Putin made it very clear, besides his very pro-Trump, pro-American statements, which were a bit unexpected, what he did say was that Russia is looking for negotiations with Ukraine only based on the prior agreements of March, April 2022, which was the peace talks that took place in Turkey, of which we don't have any information, essentially. And those peace talk documents have never been published openly. But we know that those peace talks were broken down, essentially, by um, intervention through uh, Boris Johnson, the prime minister at the time of the UK, and essentially by the Ukrainian side. So those peace talks were abandoned. But Putin made it clear that he wants to go back to those peace talks specifically. So what was so key and interesting about those peace talks, I'm not too sure, because remember, one of the goals was, again, demilitarization of Ukraine, which definitely hasn't been met. Ukraine has been ultra-militarized since the beginning of the SMO, like beyond any beyond anything that we've seen in the you know, recent decades. And again, has Ukraine been denazified in any capacity? No, in fact, it's been essentially re-nazified. Banderism has risen and has become more popular than ever. Azov Battalion has grown. All the Ukrainian uh, ultra-nationalist battalions have in- increased in size, and one of which I think we'll discuss in a little moment. And again, uh, Ukraine's ascension into NATO. That's, I think, the only objective which really has been met because we saw recent comments by J.D. Vance where he stated that he actually wanted to put off Ukraine joining NATO by several decades, right? So he really wanted to push that back. And I think that's you know, it's good enough, but you have to consider countries like Israel, Conrad, South Korea, they don't have any agreements. They're not members of NATO, but they have military defense treaties with NATO. And so perhaps Ukraine in the future, even not being a member state of NATO, will have a similar treaty similar to that of Israel and South Korea. So that doesn't exactly make the situation any better for Russia and any sort of pro-Russian politicians, I think, geopolitically. But regarding those Bandera, Bandera presence in the Ukraine and their persecution of the church, we saw the Church of the Tibes. Remember, this was the first church that was occupied by inside of the Kiev Pechersk Lavra by Ukrainian uh, militants. And this was in March 2023. And you recall the actual the crosses atop of the church, were, which were gold and shining, they actually darkened and became black. There was all kinds of videos and photographs, very ominous sign, of course, sent by God when the monks were kicked out of the Kiev Pechersk Lavra. And inside this church of the Tibes, the Ukrainian Bandera militant, allegedly revolutionary Christian network and party called the Brotherhood. And this is led by the man we discussed a few weeks back, Dmitry Korchinsky, essentially the Ukrainian Ukro Nazi version of Igor Strelkov. So he was he's a veteran of several conflicts. In fact, he actually fought with the Chechens against the Russians in the 90s. He's fought literally on every opposing side that that has fought Russian forces. He's fought with Georgia, he's fought he's fought on the side of Bosnia, all kinds of like this guy's history is literally a, a who's who, and he's fought against Russia his entire life. He's 60 years of age. And his particular party called Brotherhood was present in the Church of Tibes. They had like a massive meeting. Why this is important is because th- this particular organization, it's not just like the Azov Battalion. Uh, Dmitry Korchinsky has mentioned that his particular organization, these military trained uh, hooligans will essentially attempt to take churches away from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is Moscow aligned. He's made that very clear. Members of this Brotherhood organization will, were present uh, in the siege against the Archangel Michael Cathedral in Cherkasy. We know this for sure. And they've literally made a church of the types inside of the Kiev Church Lava, essentially their home base. And this was allowed by the mayor of Kiev and by the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture, which at first proclaimed it to be a museum, but now they're allowing literally a Benderite organization to have a, essentially a meeting. The footage from the meeting was actually insane, Conrad, because these guys, they claim to be Christian. They claim to be Orthodox in their own sense. In fact, many of them, as Jan Taksur and other Ukrainian Orthodox journalists have reported, actually don't go to church at all. So a lot of these militant, it's literally a, a trad LARP that's taking place here. A lot of these people don't attend church. They're not catechized in any capacity. They're simply pretending to be Christians, but they are taking a lot of symbolism from the Russian forces. They have, their main symbol is the red Constantinian labarum, the X and the P, and it's sort of like a red, black, and white sort of, I guess you can say almost like Third Reichian symbolism there. They have, again, the icon of the face of Christ, but in a red, white, and black, not like a gold and red background. So they have their own distinct flags and symbols, which, again, relate to Orthodox Christianity, but with its own particular flavor. And we know it's almost like a simulacrum, which is being created here. 
And so there's fears that Dmitry Korchinsky and his organization will begin purging Orthodox Christians and essentially chasing them down. More footage, again, of persecution has been released. Ukrainian journalists have been traveling around the outskirts and the countryside of the Dvorska Oblast. This is far western Ukraine. And they were actually interviewing local farmers, asking them if there were any secret gatherings on their land, in any barns, were there any secret Orthodox churches aligned with Moscow. So they were interviewing these local farmers. Some of the farmers were not answering any of the question, but some were essentially snitching and claiming that, well, maybe we've seen this local church that they, they point to the fact that it was shut down, but they're not sure where the local priest moved his worship, where exactly the new church was placed in some sort of barn or on some sort of farm. So as, as you can see, it's literally Orthodox Christians in Western Ukraine are being chased down. Now they're actually essentially having a catacomb type situation, which really, I think, the analogy is very clear. It's literally the 1930s of the USSR prior to the Second World War, where all of worship and had to be moved essentially on the ground into unofficial structures and things of that nature. So in Western Ukraine, it's quite bad. And this is why I think we're of the opinion that if there was a piece of Ukraine, the Orthodox Church would need to be placed under some sort of protection from international organizations or under some sort of protection from the Russian Federation officially, and the persecution would need to end. Why we say this is because after Trump's victory, Metropolitan Agafangel of Odessa, who we've spoken about for a few weeks now, is one of the most senior Orthodox Christian bishops in Eastern Europe. He's actually sent an official letter to Donald J. Trump congratulating him on his victory. And officially in that letter, he mentions the fact that he wishes Donald Trump a long sort of a long life. He sends blessings to Melania Trump. It's a very nice sort of letter, but he does mention the fact that he wishes Donald J. Trump to essentially assist in stopping the persecution in the Ukraine. And he doesn't make any reference, of course, to Russia or the fact that Russia is going to stop the persecution in any capacity. And he doesn't throw any accusations around against the Ukrainian government. He just says that there was a misunderstanding in Ukraine and now there's a persecution happening. He's not naming any names. He's not blaming anyone. But he's just saying that Donald J. Trump, he needs to look into this particular situation. And look, this letter by Mitchpolton Agafankel, who we know he's not a pro-Russian bishop in Ukraine. He's, again, the bishop of one of the richest, wealthiest dioceses. Odessa, again, port city, Ismail as well. It's very clear that he's just seeking a third party to sort of step in and perhaps protect Orthodox Christians. I wouldn't, a lot of Russians were making fun of Mitch Bolton you know, essentially mocking him for this particular letter. But if you take his perspective on board, I think he's just seeking to end the persecution for the sake of his own flock. I think he's, and if Trump is that particular figure who could maybe be made aware that there is an actual active persecution taking place, perhaps he could step in. At the same time, we do see people like J.D. Vance. Again, he's very well aware through his connection with Tucker Carlson. They are aware that the persecution is taking place in some capacity, but perhaps they aren't aware of the details and they need to be made aware of them. And perhaps this letter by Metropolitan Agafangel is one way in which, in which the message will get across to the presidential administration. Again, very hopeful, but in any way, you know, everyone needs to sort of play their role. And I think the local bishops of Ukraine, they're just trying their best in order to protect their flock, in order to allow them to receive the sacraments at their usual churches, at the usual cathedrals, because we don't have to understand on a spiritual level, Ukraine is just as much of a battlefield as it is on a geopolitical scale, because Ukraine is the place where a lot of cults are created, new age movements, a lot of very degenerate religious heresies, of course, arose in this particular land. We know Chabad Lubavitch is very active. There's a lot of spiritual battles which take place. And again, unionism as well. We saw a Ukrainian union priest actually on the eve of the US election called Donald Trump the Antichrist and the devil, which was very bizarre. But again, uh, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine has always sort of been on its toes, is always battling against the sort of spiritual enemies in the region. And now again, it's a victim of geopolitical uh, c- circumstances too. So we can't, I think, really point fingers at Metropolitan Agafangel, despite the fact that he's not very a pro-Russian bishop and sort of make fun of him for sending this very nice and very, shall we say, knee-bending letter to Donald Trump, almost as if Donald Trump was a Byzantine or Roman emperor, or he was a king of some sort. This is the exact language in which the letter was written. So I think he was just trying his best. Now the situation every week, there are more updates on the persecution front, which is the main reason why we do openly support the, you know, the Russian war effort in Ukraine. But uh, to move away from that, we're getting close on time here. We got to discuss a few of the other smaller World War III fronts that we always get into. Brief update, Nicaragua, the Sandinista regime there has, for some kind of humanitarian purposes, they're opening up their lands. They're inviting U.S., U.K., Russian, all sorts of troops from around the world, which 
Cuban, you know, Chinese, it would be the first time there were Russian and Chinese troops deployed actually on the mainland of North America, which would be a very interesting development. I don't know all of the details. Nicaragua is a very interesting place. They're kind of actively persecuting the Catholic Church there. They're very communist. They're ostensibly aligned with China and Russia, but very small. It's not like it's that strong of an alliance per se, but it's interesting. We'll watch it and see how that develops because it's you know, kind of reminiscent of the situation with Cuba, Venezuela, these other countries that are more partial to the quote-unquote multipolar world, specifically from the communist days. But a more interesting dispute that I find that, I've, that we've been covering very closely is the ethiopia Somaliland, Somalia general dispute. We know that Ethiopia wants to get its port in Somaliland, but we also know that Egypt and Somalia and Turkey, they've signed these joint cooperation agreements where basically if Somalia comes under attack, Egypt will have troops there. They will be directly defending them. And this is from Marie.com, which is an African Somalian source. It says, Ethiopian troops have reportedly taken full control of an airfield in Dalo town, Gedo region, under the orders of Jubaland President Ahmed Madobi, amid tensions over Somalia's one-person, one-vote electoral system. So basically, there's a lot of regions of Somalia, and the Mogadishu government doesn't really have control over those regions. For example, Somali land, the you know, north kind of panhandle of Somalia is kind of has its own government that wants to be independent. Juba land is the far south region of Somalia that has another big border with Ethiopia. And basically the president of Juba land is allowing Ethiopian troops to come in and take control of these airfields, which is very big because the understanding is that if Somalia and Ethiopia were to come to a military conflict, Egypt would be flying troops into these air bases on the, on the Ethiopian border with Somalia and be able to engage them directly. But Obviously, Ethiopia is a much more powerful military than Somalia. That's why Somalia needs help from the Arab League and all of these other Muslim countries, because if not, they, it's a failed state. They don't even have control and jurisdiction over the majority of their territory, not even including the terrorists. Like the terrorists control huge yeah. territory. And then you have, you know, lawful civilian governments just trying to run it. I mean, the governments in Juba land and Puntland and Somaliland, they all frankly run the local regions better than the Mogadishu government runs Mogadishu or the parts of Somalia that they control. So it's really no surprise there. And this kind of coincides with the Sudanese civil war, which obviously Sudan would ostensibly be siding with Somalia as Egypt is a supporter of the government there. There's rumors that Chad has started supporting the rapid support forces, but I believe Chad has denied this. We know that most of the RSF support comes from the United Arab Emirates. So we'll keep you posted on the Sudan situation. But it's very interesting that we have Ethiopian troops you know, in Somalia against the will of the Mogadishu government. So the Horn of Africa dispute is ongoing and you know it seems to be heating up so we're going to be following that closely as well and the other main conflict that we like to cover that i want to talk about is of course the situation in myanmar this is from the bangkok post china's premier vows support for myanmar in junta chief meeting beijing beijing offers backing to regime that's losing ground to rebels this is from yangon it says chinese premier li Qiang pledged to support myanmar's government during a rare sit down with junta chief min on min on klong a sign Beijing is seeking to stabilize a regime, losing ground in a worsening civil conflict. China supports Myanmar in advancing the political reconciliation and transformation process, Li said during the meeting Wednesday in Kunming in southwestern China. According to the official the Xinhua news agency, Beijing also stands ready to work with Myanmar to advance its interest in the country, Li said, including via an economic corridor and projects under the Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. Min Aung Klang pledged to protect interests of China during the talks. Myanmar's ruling state administration council said in a statement, both leaders also discussed the resumption of border trade, which has been suspended due to intensifying clashes. The junta leader was making his first official visit to China since his forces toppled the government in a coup in 2021, arresting its civilian leader, including pro-democracy figure Aung San Suu Kyi. Since then, the regime has suffered unprecedented territorial losses to ethnic armed groups along Myanmar's northern border with China. It's actually a lot more than just the northern border with China. It's most of the... Mm -hmm western part of the country. The United States has sanctioned people and entities linked to Myanmar's military, and President Joe Biden has warned that further costs will be imposed if the junta doesn't hold elections. So this is interesting because we know that one of the few places that Trump may be more likely to escalate fronts in the World War III realm is the China front. We know that he is much closer with China hawks, these pro-Taiwan people, all of these sorts of things. And this could be China realizing that now they need to even if they don't really love the junta as much as some of the other people they support, they need to sack up and support them and make sure that Myanmar doesn't fall to become another one of these pro-Western democracies like they were before the 2021 coup and where the, the junta took over. So 
very interesting development there. We've been saying that China had been kind of dragging its feet on supporting the junta, partially because their ethnic Chinese militias fighting against the junta that they perhaps saw is, you know, maybe they just cut their losses and carve out regional influence on their border regions. But I think China is enough of a superpower now where that would be a sign of weakness. They should be able to have soft power influence over the entire country of Myanmar. So that's the development as far as that front goes, Dimitri. I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on any of these fronts, any other thoughts, final thoughts on the election, anything we discussed? Obviously, it's been a very big show. Yeah, and of course, it's, there's been a lot of news this week. But I think on the Myanmar front, specifically, it's the first sort of modern Chinese conflict wherein China could utilize some of its special ops strategists, essentially utilize some of its proxy war tactics, which by supporting the junta, supporting the sort of incumbent government at the moment that came to power in the COVID era. And, you know, China was blamed, of course, for the Wuhan COVID outbreak. So essentially, it's one of these post-COVID pandemic conflicts, which again, really hasn't settled, but hasn't received as much attention as what's taking place in the Middle East or Eastern Europe in general. But I think it's just as important for the, for China, for I think Chinese geopolitical interests. It's the first real conflict that China has had that, ha- that potentially will have long ranging influences. Now we have spoken about the South China Sea, but that really hasn't coalesced into anything into anything just yet. But I think this will be one of the war fronts on the ground. Essentially, China's access to Southeast Asia, some of those larger economies and its presence in Southeast Asia will, of course, be determined by its relationship to the future, maybe very pro-Chinese junta government, which will be in power in Myanmar if China has its way. It is a very Donetsk, Lugansk type situation, frankly, Conrad. You can clearly see it's very similar to, you know, essentially Somalia using the same special military operation type so-called peace intervention technologies in the way they conduct themselves with their neighboring countries. And I think Russia has really set a standard in this particular capacity, which Israel also uses in southern Lebanon. So all these conflicts have certain similarities, which we can kind of draw across. There's certainly experiences being traded globally at this point. Globalization is really taking place in terms of people trading knowledge, experience, looking at various failures of one side and sort of taking on their victories and kind of trying to copy these strategies. So I think Myanmar, well, that's why we always view this particular conflict, because remember China's, one of China's historical victories was again in the Vietnam War uh, by supporting North Vietnam against the United States and essentially that the sort of capitalist liberal coalition and again in supporting North Korea against South Korea, which the USSR also did so. That, but that was sent uh, decades ago at this point. And sort of in the modern context, Myanmar is this first real proxy war against democratic forces. If you can call it anything, Conrad, it would be Myanmar can be compared very closely to Russia's presence and it could be very closely compared to Assad Syria, where Russia essentially supported the Assad regime in a similar way. You'll have the People's Republic of China supporting the regime of the junta, which came to power in 2021, which is very militaristic, but that's very much in China's in China's flavor and the way China likes to do things, we see China's relationship with North Korea really hasn't debilitated, regardless of North Korean, a very pro, a pro-militaristic pro rhetoric over the last few decades. So we know China likes, regardless of its uh, sort of peaceful intentions in the region, as it claims, it does like these sort of militaristic regimes to be surrounding it. And it likes to sort of bolster them and to uphold their reign over particular areas. So, And I think China's on the clock at the moment. Once Donald Trump is made president in January. And again, he begins his policies, most of which I think will be most likely anti-Chinese and potentially even his rapprochement with Russia, his sort of amicable, agreeable relationship with Vladimir Putin will move Trump to perhaps commence a new economic trade war against the Chinese Republic there and potentially even rhetorically against the so-called you know, against so-called communism. So this is why China is making these very clear symbolic moves by inviting the junta leader to visit them in Beijing. So very uh, sort of powerful PR statement there. Yeah, just to cover a few issues, miscellaneous, we know that in the aftermath of the Trump victory, his team has been releasing these edited scripted videos about policy. And he talked about banning, you know, transgender surgeries, you know, disencouraging, you know, even transgender surgery propaganda for adults, having the only legally recognized genders in the U.S. be male and female, and they're recognized at birth, and you can't change them. This is all very good stuff, which again, it sounds like basic stuff everybody understands, but at that administrative level within the bureaucracy, you can kind of root this out. This is going to be very important for kind of restoring America to sanity. Another big thing that happened in the aftermath of the Trump victory was Bitcoin skyrocketed right now. It's at an all-time high of of 77,500 US dollars per Bitcoin, which is very, very, it's wild. You know, a lot of people I know bought Bitcoin before the election in anticipation of this and that, and that investment very much has paid off already. So 
big future for Bitcoin. You know, I know crypto and that that whole world, you know, the blockchain and that future is very much, you know, surging into our reality. So I've been talking with some people that are, you know, very aware of the meta on that and how it truly is going to transform society and how we need to get ahead of it, you know, as people and that we can, you know, if the church is utilizing this technology, it needs to, that the church needs to use it and sanctify it or else, you know, these kinds of things can eventually enslave us. So very interesting developments across the board there to say the least. But unless you have anything else to say, Dimitri, regarding the sort of final situation, I know that some sad news, of course, Archbishop Peter of Chicago in mid-America, he reposed rather suddenly very recently the past few days, and that was caught people off guard. He was not necessarily sick. I do have you know, my suspicions as to what may have caused it. That's, you know, not the time nor place. It's not here, but be sure to pray for his soul, his repose for the Archdiocese of, you know, Chicago and Mid-America of Rocor. It's a very large, very, you know, physically large and has a lot of parishes, you know, diocese, and they're going to need a shepherd. So pray that the synod and the bishops can decide properly. And that again, Archbishop Peter can be, you know, received into the heavenly realm and that keep praying for him and that his memory may be eternal. But as far as any other church news that I'm aware of, I, I don't think there is any. I know that I recently celebrated the Feast of the Holy Archangels at the monastery near me, which was a wonderful, glorious occasion. But the whole Trump situation obviously has everybody talking. But I think one of my final observations about that is that, you know, the victory was larger. I think even though we're seeing all of these female reactions, you know, to these joke videos and all these sorts of things, I think the people are going to start, as I said earlier, people are going to start moving away from all this woke stuff, obviously. And I think that, unfortunately, we hope that Trump will stick to his isolation, his promises. But generally speaking, as, you know, world Jewry and American Jewry has shifted to the right since October 7th, so will American society. And we will see, obviously, it seems that that's good. Jewry is allowing Trump to roll back a lot of their excesses, particularly the transgender phenomenon, which we know was entirely a Jewish phenomenon. But you know, where's the give and take on these sorts of things? If that's what we're going to get, if they're going to give us this, if they're going to give us border walls, then unfortunately, my fear is that, you know, the price we pay for that is war with Iran is securing greater Israel. So we're going to be watching it obviously very closely. Thank you very much for listening. Obviously, be sure to subscribe to worldwarnow.co. That is our home base. You get access to all of the shows right when they come out, all of our articles. And that is how you can get behind the paywall, become an Ether Hour supporter. And you can get access to all of our premium episodes where we interview all sorts of people like Russian frontline journalist Andrei Afanasiev. We talk with Jim Jatris. We talk to Father John Whiteford. We talk to a host of other people. We're going to be talking to bishops in the future. We have great episodes about St. John Vitatsis and the prophecies there. So be sure to subscribe, support the show. Obviously, subscribe to the YouTube channel, World War Now, even if you're a Substack listener. Get on there. I know you're on YouTube as well, so be sure to subscribe, leave comments, like, support the show. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Be sure to find us on there. Get us on your RSS feed. Subscribe to the Telegram channel, World War Now Telly. That is our 24-7 news feed. Follow us on X, World War Now underscore. Follow me on X at Gnome Rat. I am on my way to 10,000 followers. Please help me get there. Dimitri is at O Canonist on X. We're also on Rumble. So again, be sure to check out all of our socials, everything like that. Keep us in your prayers, most importantly, in the midst of all of these crazy times as we are living through the prophetic words of many of the 20th century elders and those that came before them. So keep us in your prayers. Keep the church in your prayers, those persecuted in Ukraine, those persecuted in Palestine and Lebanon under fire. So we know that World War III is not you know, it is not the most peaceful time to live as an Orthodox Christian. So keep everyone in your prayers. And with all of that, thank you for listening. Dimitri, I will leave you with the last word. God bless. Thank you for supporting the show, everyone. Thank you for supporting what we do here. And we wish you a wonderful week. And congratulations to all those Americans who have voted in the more conservative candidate in this election. I think it's a huge victory. So you should definitely pat yourselves on the back for participating in that. And hopefully this will bring around positive fruits, but we'll be covering it regardless of what the outcomes are. Thank you, Conrad, for those closing words.